How did baby feeding make you feel? Did you feel empowered by the experience? Did you feel like you were crushing your goals? Did you feel defeated and more anxious based on how your baby feeding went? My hope with every client and really every listener of the podcast is that however you end up feeding your baby, you feel empowered by the experience. And as it turns out, the actual way you feed your baby is not what is correlated to feeling good about the postpartum experience. What makes people feel good is the amount of support they get. That's professional support, like the help of IBCLCs. That is peer support. That is family and friend support. And any one of these types of supporters can either uplift or tear down somebody who is experiencing a new thing, welcoming a baby into their life, learning how to take care of them in the way that meets both their needs, their baby's needs, their partner's needs. So as you're listening to today's episode with Rachel of the Answer to Everything podcast, I want you to think about two different things. One If you have ever welcomed a baby into your life, how did the support you got from other people either help you feel empowered or contribute to a feeling of failure? And then secondly, when you are speaking to a new parent, are the things that you are saying to them helping them feel really good about where they are and about their ability to look inward? and make decisions that are best for them? Or do you make people feel as if they can't trust their gut and they need to reconsider all the decisions that they have made so far? This can be intentional or unintentional. So I'm your host, Lo Nigrosh. I'm an IBCLC, a childbirth educator and a doula on a mission to help people understand their baby feeding choices, the things that make it difficult, and how to meet your baby feeding goals. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Rachel. Welcome to the Milk Making Minutes. I'm so glad you're here. Hi, thanks for having me here. Yeah, so I have invited you on both as a person who has fed a baby and as a professional. So we're going to start out talking about your baby feeding stories, and then listeners can tune in to the very next episode to hear you talk about how we help people in the postpartum period, both Mm -hmm. as other perinatal professionals and as friends and family members, Um, which I think will be so valuable. Yes. Um, Because you go ahead and introduce yourself and then people will understand why I have brought you on for both of those things. Okay. My name is Rachel Seavers. I'm a mom. Mm -hmm. My baby is 13 years old. Um, Uh, I have been in private practice. I'm a retired psychotherapist. I'm a counselor and life coach. I've been practicing for about 12 years now. And I also have a mental health podcast called The Answer to Everything, um, where I actually record sessions with my clients so people can be like a fly on the wall in real counseling sessions. And then I debrief and talk about it and give people mental health tips. So my whole world is really mental health and momming. Yeah. That's all I do. <laughs> yeah. Which all of us who are moms, we're kind of in that stage where even if we aren't professionals, our whole worlds are mental health and momming because we have to be so aware of our own mental health as people who guide the ships of our families and the mental health of the people in our care. Yeah. I, ideally, that's what moms are doing. Right. Not all yeah. moms, but yeah. <laughs> the ones yeah. who are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And your podcast is really great. I like the mix because you get to hear... Um, people talk about what they're struggling with. You get to hear how they respond to you, but then you also step back and do some editorial. You know, you talk about the situation and how people can apply it to their lives a bit more broadly beyond just the conversation you've had with the individual you're speaking with. So it's really, really great because it's a good mix. I always like to hear what is a mental health professional telling this person? And also Mm -hmm. what's the broader picture here that we can all apply to our lives? 
my my goal with it is really is to get counseling into everybody's hands. Yes. For some people, there's a stigma around it, so they won't go. For some people, financially, they can't go. For some people, mm -hmm. the logistics of it just won't work. They've got kids or they have physical ailments that keep them from going. So really being able to be in the room, listening to a client and their counselor, the back and forth that happens there, I'm hoping that it's blessing people hoping. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I've loved every episode I've heard. Cool. Thank you for that. Yeah. Feedback. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. As pod podcasting is this, I don't know, you don't get a lot of feedback. No. You just put it there and hope that someone's getting something from it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's so true. Unless you just have somebody who reaches out because it really impacted them. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for talking about your podcast a little bit. I hope everybody checks it out. And of course, it'll all be linked in the show notes. Um, but I want to take you back to before you had your 13 year old baby and <laughs> all the way back into your childhood, um, because the Milk Making Minutes is all about exploring the barriers that make feeding difficult. Mm. And I have found that these barriers begin in our earliest moments. Um, and so I would love to know what your exposure to babies and to baby feeding was as a child. A big fat zero. Yeah. <laughs> big fat zero. I wasn't breastfed. I didn't have siblings, young siblings. Mm -hmm. I didn't mm -hmm. have cousins. I didn't have any babies around. My baby was the really the first baby I ever had contact with. Mm -hmm. I learned how to mom by reading books. Yeah. Yeah. And that has been a huge shift societally in the last 100 to 200 years that we parent in these really insular groups. So often, oh, anthropologically speaking, we grew up, we evolved in these larger social groups, not huge, but there is some data to suggest that every baby had five to 12 primary caregivers. And mm -hmm. then once they were old enough to move around, they joined the circle of other young people and other children were caring for the younger children. And so you had exposure to other babies and other families from your earliest mom. And so many of us don't. We see babies maybe out at the grocery store or something, but they're not a part of our everyday life. So we don't actually even always know what is normal biological baby behavior and what is, oh man, I'm really struggling in this situation. Such a great point. Such a great point. And I think that m most people don't know uh, and even if they are taught, they can believe it. I don't know if you, maybe you've run into this, but uh, the touch, the eye contact, the joining of the nervous systems, all of that happens in our own infancy prepares us to do that in adulthood with our children. Right. It's like our body knows how to do it if it was done to us. And so mm -hmm. if we're missing that component, we have to consciously do right. those things. And I think that's grossly undervalued. People are very uneducated about it. And I'm not sure why people don't believe, <laughs> believe when yeah. I, when I try to teach people that they're like, nah, well, if I didn't remember it, it doesn't count. Right. Exactly. Well, I think one of the big challenges is that there was a movement in the 20th century to really have well-behaved babies who followed schedules. Yes. And this came from professionals and from medical providers. Mm -hmm. And it also came out of the need to have babies on more schedules because more women were entering the workforce. And so right. they were asking for it. And instead of the response being, you know, this is tough. We have to find a way to both meet babies' biological needs and to find a way for you to go into the workforce, we then tried to mold babies into sleeping longer stretches than they're bio biologically intended, to being alone, laying down by themselves, not in arms. And then the babies who were not doing that, who were not meeting those expectations, then became problematic. And then we always feel like once we become parents, we need to fix our babies. That right. they're broken. As somehow they're representing me 
bad if they're not quiet enough or if they're not able to go play in the other room by themselves for two hours or something. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Or if I have to hold, you know, I have so many clients oh, say my baby will needy. only sleep in my arms. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. because That's we are very sleep. Yeah. I always say, have you ever seen a primate put their baby down to sleep? And they're always yeah. like, no. I said, yeah, we're carry mammals. So we are not intended to put our babies to sleep. Deer, they put their babies in a nest and they wander off for hours. And then they come back and they feed their babies again. But their milk composition is such, if you look at the components of deer milk versus the components of human milk or primate milk, you can see that this evolved together because mm -hmm. our milk is such that it is highly nutritious, but you need lots of it very frequently. Whereas deer milk is such that the babies can go longer stretches without mm. eating. Okay. Yeah. You so know, learning, this is such cool information. I love it. Yeah. So I, it's just interesting. I started out by asking about your childhood and you said zero. And it just made me think about all this stuff. It's nobody's fault when it's hard in the postpartum period, because this has been a, sh a societal shift. That right. many of us who are trying to be more conscientious parents are trying to break. But as you mm -hmm. said, if that's not what our brains did as infants, it's more work. It's so it's breaking generational cycles. Con really. Yeah, con consciously. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Awesome. So then as you were preparing to have your own baby, so you've gotten through your childhood, you had zero babies around. What kinds of things were you thinking about in pregnancy in terms of baby feeding and what kind of prep? did you do, if any? Uh, I, I knew that I wanted to have lots of touch and mm -hmm. I, and that, that was like during feeding or during sleep or cause I knew that's something that I lacked and I would have just hoping and praying to God that I had it in me to be a touching mom. Cause nobody really touched me. Mm. That's not true. I had a sister who was motherly mothering to me much older than I was. But, um, so my goal was to, my plan was to breastfeed skin to skin for as long as possible, quit my job. I tried to work some part-time shifts for a couple months and I, I just, I couldn't, I could just couldn't be away from my baby. I just couldn't do it. Mm. I just quit altogether, collected mm. food stamps and took care of my baby, stayed at home. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so important. And really, this is one of the other barriers, right? We all should be able to do that. And mm -hmm. we should have the societal supports to be able to take as that time off during that first year, two years to bond with our babies, feed them, totally hold agree. them, and not be worrying about going back to work at week 12. Yeah. I want to be really clear here that I understand not everybody can do that. And yes, I, it's not, like I was, it's not like I was rich. It was just, I happened to be just willing to lose everything Yeah, <laughs> to, to stay at home right. with my baby. But I understand not everybody can do that. So I don't want right. this to feel like a shaming, a mom shaming thing. If you yeah. can't quit your job to stay home with your yeah. baby, I get that. Yeah. This is yeah. just my story. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. So that was your plan in, in, in pregnancy. <laughs> so tell me it. how those, those first moments went with feeding your baby and any difficulties you had. We'll start there. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> skin to skin right away. Um, after I proclaimed how beautiful she was, <laughs> I just couldn't, I couldn't believe this beautiful baby came from me. She was just all this big black hair sticking Aww. out everywhere. And she was just so pretty and immediately to the breast and pretty immediately frustrated, just mm -hmm. really frustrated. And it's, I was pretty much feeding around the clock and she would get tired. I would be in so much pain. Um, but especially on this breast, she would be really frustrated. I then got mastitis, um, mm. maybe two or three weeks postpartum. Oh, wow. She would get frustrated. And of course I would get tense and we, I had a lactation consultant come to the house a few times. Everything's fine. Just keep trying. 
You're just going to have to get used to it. You put this on your breast so it feels better. It seemed that the whole experience, which in, in my head, I had this idea of it would be this bonding, wonderful. We'd be gazing into each other's eyes and loving mm-hmm. one another. It was turning into, you know, her flailing around, just hungry. She was just hungry. And yeah. I couldn't give her what she wanted and needed. And that was so um, scary. And mm. sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those earliest times with our baby are the time. I, I think it can set the tone for the mm-hmm. rest of our motherhood, unless we're very conscious about how we are starting to feel about ourselves as mothers during these moments when the difficulty arises. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you had an IBCLC come to your house and I, the message that I heard you say, the line that what she said to you was, everything's fine. You just have to get used to it. Mm-hmm. And I am on a mission to get other IBCLCs and lactation professionals to stop telling people they are fine or their latch is good mm-hmm. when that's not how they're feeling. Mm-hmm. Because the only person who can say whether or not they are fine or their latch is good is the person who is feeding the baby. Mm, I love that. So I'm wondering when you have this person who's supposed to be a professional come in and say, yeah, everything's fine. You just need to try harder. (laughs) What, (laughs) What impact did that have on you? I'm left very much with I'm doing something wrong here. I'm not getting it right. I'm not getting the position right. I'm not. I'm failing somehow. Mm. Mm. or I'm supposed to be adjusting my idea of what is wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes when we are supporting people in the perinatal period, uh, we do have to help them understand like what is normal and what is not normal. Even when it comes to mental health, like, you know, di- distinguishing between, yeah, baby blues, there's an adjustment and postpartum mental mental health disorders, for instance. Um, That is a part of our job, all of us who are in the perinatal period, at least knowing, hey, I think you need to go see somebody. This might be beyond like just normal hormonal shifts, for instance. But also we need to be encouraging people to look inward and say, how are you feeling about how this is going? Hmm. And give them the opportunity to say, yeah, this is not working. Right. Or, yeah, it's working. It's really hard, but I feel like I'll get over the hump. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, No, I knew my baby was hungry. Mm -hmm. And I knew she was frustrated when she was Mm -hmm. trying to feed from my breast. I knew these things. And I Mm. didn't, I, it's, I couldn't give her, I couldn't satiate her. No matter yeah. how hard I tried, nothing yeah. was working. And that yeah. was just terrifying for mm. me. And how long did that last? I started pumping mm-hmm. pretty quickly because my breasts were so engorged. I had so mm. much milk and it just wasn't coming out. Yeah. So I had to pump. And so I started feeding her breast milk by the bottle just a few weeks after she was born. And then finally she could rest. She could just like yeah. eat and rest. And the experience was so much more pleasant mm. for everyone. So I, I didn't let it last too long. That's good. Yeah. I could even hear in your voice when you said she could finally rest. Yes. Yeah. We know as parents, when our babies are tense, we know mm-hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. And pumping, were you trying to feed from your body and pumping both and feeding from the bottle? Or were you, did you just switch to pumping? I'm sure I, I tried. I don't have memory, but knowing myself, I'm sure I kept trying to put her to my breast. But I think after she got a taste of the bottle, she's like, what the hell? No. <laughs> <laughs> give me the, give me the good stuff. Yeah, I don't have real clear memory, but I'm sure I did. I'm sure I did. Yeah, 
I, I right. think there, I put pressure on myself to be successful at breastfeeding. Yeah, I hear a lot of people say that. I also think it's a biological norm to feed babies from our bodies. And so it's this feeling of I really want to do this. And that's biologically normal to want to do it. And wondering why isn't it working? If this is how humans have survived over all this time, yeah. why is it so hard? So I think people don't want to give up because it's not like they think they're a bad person if they stop, but it just feels like, why isn't it working? And then, so you just keep trying, thinking it's going to click. I think back to you know, in caveman days mm -hmm. when my baby have just died from starvation mm -hmm. because my body can't give her what she needs. Mm -hmm. I think that's ugh, punch. A punch to the gut. Yeah. Well, Ugh. your sister or your aunt would have fed her or she may not have had as much difficulty because we've had epigenetic changes to our jaws. Modern mm -hmm. humans have that make feeding more difficult. Um, yeah. Yeah. Our jaws are more, you know, we have more receding chins and they're more set back. Oh, interesting. In the moment, there is this intensity to brand new parenting. Oh, yeah. That it does feel like this is never going to end. And this is the most important decision I will ever make. Yes. And now here you are 13 years later and you can't even remember if you mm -hmm. um, continued to try feeding from your body or not. Right. That detail didn't stick. Yeah. I think for me, it was probably, we're not going to bond. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have the relationship that I'm trying to build with her. There's something mm -hmm. about our connection is going to be lost, mm -hmm. which felt uh, just devastating to me. Which is why when I would bottle feed her, I would like, take off my shirt and put her mm -hmm. over here. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is, that is so hard. And I have said a few times, all these statistics that get put out there about the long-term impacts of not breastfeeding, you know, disease, breast cancer decreasing when you breastfeed and uh, gestational or uh, incidence of type two diabetes. These statistics are important, but they are not important for the people feeding babies. These are not the statistics we should be putting in front of people who are trying to feed their babies. Those are statistics for public health experts who are trying to create policy. But mm. the individual person who was just trying to get through the day and feed their baby, they don't need to be worrying about whether or not they're going to have their baby's going to have type two diabetes if they go to formula. Right. Right. So yeah. So then you, how long did you continue to pump and feed milk? I, I pumped for nine months. Wow. And that, that was a grueling nine months because mm -hmm. pump, each pumping session was like a good 45 minutes to an hour. It was like, my breast just took forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but so I had a big stockpile at nine months. So she had breast milk for a, about a year. Yeah. That's yeah. no um, small commitment to no man provide that much milk. Yeah. No man. <laughs> I was getting my master's at the time and I would have my, <laughs> I'd have my pumps on and I'd be writing papers at the computer. Right. It's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, just constantly, constantly. Yeah. It was a big yeah. deal. But it's really, really important to me that she got that nutrition, that it was mm -hmm. just super important to me. Yeah. Yeah. I tell people all the time, well, each of us has to look individually and say, what is really important to me? And if it is really important to keep doing something that is hard, that's okay. As long as we're not feeling a pressure that doesn't come from us really wanting to do it. Because you hear both things from people. You hear, oh, everybody's telling me I should just give up. And then you hear people saying, oh, no, everybody's, I feel judged because I have given up. But really, it matters. What do you think about this situation? Gosh, isn't that the truth with everything? Just stop listening to everyone else mm -hmm. and get in here. And especially as a new mother, it's just you and your baby. When it's just you and your baby, what feels good? What feels right there? Right, right. And just taking each next step as it comes not worrying about what's yes. going to happen three months from now, because they're going to be a totally different being three months from now. They change right. so fast when they're young. 
Yeah. So then was it difficult to wean off the pump or was that kind of just a gradual thing that you did? How did I wean off the pump? I think I just, um, yeah, I just shortened the sessions, spaced them out more and more Mm -hmm. over Mm -hmm. time and watched my big, beautiful breasts turn into (laughs) little flapjacks. I don't remember there being any trouble with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you, um, did you need to grieve at all the experience of not body feeding or did it feel like just a relief to be feeding your baby? So that wasn't even a part of it. It felt more like a success. Mm, Great. Yeah. Um, sure. There was some disappointment in there that breastfeeding didn't work for us, But more than that, it felt like, okay, mom, you figured it out. You're, you've figured out this new way to make her happy and take good care of her and figured out a way to bond with her while it's happening. And now her dad can bond with her during feedings too. And there were more positives that came with it for me than negatives. I love that. I wouldn't say that it was a grieving at all. That's great. A little disappointment, but not grieving. Yeah. If only we could all say to ourselves, wow, you found a way. You found a way to do this thing. Yeah. I love that. I think I, to be honest, I felt like a effing warrior for Mm. pumping. I did. I'm glad. Yeah. That's incredible. It was so hard. It was so painful. It took so much time. I had to arrange Mm. my whole life around it, which of course that's, breastfeeding too. You, everything right. revolves around that, but you know, taking those damn little things everywhere, it just, it felt like such um, a huge accomplishment to have done that yeah. for her. Yeah. And did anyone helping you, pediatrician, the IBCLC that you saw, did anyone ever try to help you understand why, sh- why you could provide enough milk with the pump, but she was not able to pull that out because there are things that we can identify to say, Ooh, this is why she's struggling. And sometimes it helps people just to know, even if they're not going to do anything about it. Did anyone even talk to you about going down that path to figure out? Because feeding is a milestone, right? And if a baby never learns to crawl or walk, we want to figure out why. And because we have other ways of feeding our babies, we now, we all often just, well, my body just didn't work. Mm -hmm. It just, Instead of one, you know, there's a babies have been keeping themselves alive this way for a long time. So let's figure out why it's it hasn't happened. Did anyone help you walk down that at all? No. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm, I maybe I was too impatient and I, I didn't let it get that far. No, I find this is very common. I just think medical providers are often like, okay, well, it didn't work. Yeah. And some parents are fine with that, and some parents want to know, and it's a balancing act if helping people to figure out how much they want to work to discover something. Knowing what, what would you say? Well, 13 years ago, we were not doing this. Let me tell you that. Um, the, you know, the, the world of oral motor function has re- I should say we, the vast majority of IBCLCs were not doing this 13 years ago, but now there's so much more we know about oral motor function. So you can do assessments and then you can help either identify anything anatomically like tongue ties that get in the way of babies removing milk or helping to just strengthen uh, the muscles of the mouth and the cheeks and the tongue or decreasing tension. So either thing can lead to um, difficulty feeding. Yeah. And, you know, it's not that every time everything works out fully, but at least parents know, oh, okay, so the tongue wasn't, isn't cupping and that's why he gets so tired or he keeps losing suction. And that's why, um, that's why he's not able to draw out enough milk or whatever it is. Yeah. And then there are like exercises you to, to strengthen. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is that as we wrap up your baby feeding story, is there yeah. anything else that you want to share about um, how that went for you or how you felt during the experience before we close out? It, um, it felt like a, a tremendous feet very accomplished i'm very happy 
my daughter has been super healthy. We have an amazing bond. Yeah, we've always had a very, very close bond and still do. <clears throat> yeah, great. Yeah, I have. Okay. <laughs> I was so proud of myself when I came up with this. So to, to warm up the baby bottle at night, so if she would go to sleep, I would fill up her bottle with the next milk supply and I would go to sleep with it tucked between my legs, like in my crotch. Oh, wow. So when she would wake up, it would be at body temperature. <laughs> it, wow. would be, it would be at the perfect temperature because I hated having to, like, she's crying and then you're like trying to boil. Mm -hmm. the, but no, I didn't want to do any of that. So she would wake up, boom, the bottle was ready, pop. <laughs> and That's so incredible. I'm just, I just want to share that with anybody who wants to try that. It was like the, it saved so much time and it was like the perfect temperature. Anyways, yeah. That was no, I've crazy. actually never heard anybody say this. I've been doing this for a long time and that mm -hmm. is brilliant. And I'm Thanks. always encouraging people <laughs> to take stuff off their baby registers. A machine that only warms up a bottle, you don't need it. Like, there are other ways to warm up bottles. Just don't uh -huh. spend your money on that. But hearing this story of putting it in between your legs when you fell asleep is brilliant. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And so in reflection, when you look back, you can say most definitely that even though you did not feed her directly from your body, that the bond that you created intentionally by being an intentional parent was not impacted. What would have been if we had breastfed? I don't know, right. but right. I'm super happy with and confident with the connection and bond that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. it, I yeah. did have to be intentional about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I always tell people we have to be when people are feeding from our bodies too, because it's, you are so tired during this time of your life. It is so easy to tune out and scroll on Instagram or mm -hmm. scroll on TikTok. And then you have barely even looked at your baby's eyes, which, hey, I get it. Sometimes you do have to do that, like just to maintain sanity. Mm -hmm. But whether you're bottle feeding or feeding from the breast, it is not just having the baby on the breast that creates that bond. It's Correct. the closeness yes. that gets created by that experience of looking at them, talking to them, gazing into their eyes. And so mm -hmm. we have to be intentional no matter, no matter the mechanism by which a baby is fed. Agreed. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for walking down memory lane with me and talking about yeah. this experience. It really does. I think it's so important to have people who are in all walks of life now, because then those who are in the thick of the baby feeding know it is going to be okay. I'll get there. Totally. Yes. Yep. And every, everybody's journey is different. Yes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I hope that as you listen to Rachel's story and as you thought about your own experiences and the way that you interact with new parents, that it helps you to feel like you can help anybody to feel good about their experiences, regardless of whether or not you agree with the decisions that they are making. The most important thing is that we can all look inward and say, you know what? I am doing my very best and I am reaching out to get the support I need if I feel like what I am doing could be improved or I could learn something to make it better. So speaking of support, if you are currently pregnant or you know somebody who is, go right now to my website, www.quabinbirthservices.com and click on courses. You're going to see childbirth education for a great postpartum. I am still offering this course at a 50% discount because I had a glitch with my website and it turns out people were not able to add the course to the cart. So I am extending my 50% discount. One other thing to note about this course is that most of the time, you can get either partial or full reimbursement for childbirth education courses. So if you are looking for a way to both understand the physiology and hormones of childbirth, understand your birth setting options, understand your intervention options and how they impact you all through the lens of making decisions as different variables come up that will positively impact you in the postpartum period, then sign up for the course, share it with your friends. I cannot wait to meet with you and discuss this. See you soon.